asking us to pray for Jeff. Um, Jeff is an individual that the people down in Firm Rudy Greendale have been uh, supporting for some time, and certainly Bill has been supporting for quite some time. And um, he is blind, and he is just been approved, and he's going to start school for 16-week training at the Bosma School for the Blind. Um, Bill's been working on that for almost a year, so that's finally taking place. Cheryl, uh, good morning. Our prayers are with you. Vivian, you made it. Hi, Vivian. Everybody says hi, Vivian. <laughs> and everybody's got a bag packed. I think they're coming down to Florida, so you better uh, get the rooms ready. Catherine, good morning. Um, Sandy in uh, Wisconsin, good morning. Dave Donnelly, my cousin down in Florida, good morning. The Jacksons are here. Welcome, Jackson family. Uh, Jeannie down out in California. Welcome. Uh, Kathy, the Burrells are on board. Connie, uh, yeah, you're watching from the, uh, from the Greendale because Roger's with you. Awesome. Um, Christine says, hi, Vivian. And Vivian says, come on down. You just ask for trouble. You just ask for trouble. Michelle. Oh my goodness. What a nice surprise. Wow. Um, all right, everybody. Um, this is the, uh, we're two days away from ending our 40-day fast and prayer. Um, and so this is our, our, our last Sunday to be emphasizing that at this time. Um, for those of you on the 40-day fast and prayer, if you desire to continue to be connected, I want to encourage you to go to the Firmly Rooted Oxford page on Facebook, and you can then be involved in the 8.30 devotion and 9 o'clock prayer that we do uh, Monday through Friday. And if you're a guy out there and you want to be connected to our men's devotion Monday through Friday, you can uh, look up um, Rooted Men. It's a group on Facebook, Rooted Men, and we'll get you connected to that, and um, and you can be a part of that. The Phillips, invite them here. And also, if you're in town, Elder Tim says, come to the Legacy Center and have study with us and worship with us. Um, the Phillips are in the house, and Phillips, uh, Violet is here. Um, I got to see her this morning. Chris is here. I haven't seen Chris in, wow, months. So great to see uh, uh, them here. Um, all right, let's let's do the prayer thing, and then we'll we'll get into a little bit of a uh, a study. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace, and we thank you for for the for on this day for a Sabbath, a day of rest. When you, Father, created the day of rest, it's probably not the way we define rest in the United States. It's a kingdom rest. What you're inviting us to is to shut off our commitments and responsibilities to the kingdom of this world so that we might press into your kingdom. Not just nothingness, it's not stopping and doing nothing. that we're resting from the toil of this life, the resting of the toil and the work of, of what we do in the kingdom of this world so that we can look up and be reminded of who you are, reminded of what you have done, reminded of the eternal truths that govern our lives, that you are unchanging though we live in a changing world, that you are eternal even though we're temporal, that all of those resting in all those truths are like one massive reminder of our priorities. And it's a way in which we can seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then everything else will be added. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, 40 days, fasting and praying, people all over the country, not just in our group, but people all over the country have committed themselves to prayer before this election. And we wanna thank you for all that you have done and all that you are doing. 
In most cities in our country, there is still peace. We pray that you would continue to allow that peace to reside over our nation. And where there is no peace, you would call it to peace, that you would end the conflict. That there not be a city in our nation where people cannot freely go and vote. And that every vote counts and that every vote is true and right. That you would shine light into dark places for those who might want to uh, obscure or alter, those who might want to prevent us from voting. As you have been, continue to, to, for the next several days, do the same. And Father, for those who may be plotting yuckiness and ugliness even after the election, no, shine light into those places and reveal them. Expose them. Heavenly Father, remind us as a people that no matter what party we belong to, we're probably not as far apart from each other as our media says we are. We're probably not as far apart from each other as our politicians would say we are. I pray that the people of the United States would, would speak out to those forces and just tell them to stop. We're here to be a United States. Father, we ask that you would continue to bless children and teachers as they are in all the PPE gear and all the things that they do. Father, bless them and be with them. Just want to honor those teachers who are courageously just from the very beginning, especially here in Oxford and other, other communities, doing what was necessary at a lot of cost, both financially and, and emotionally and psychologically to do the right thing. Continue to bless, continue to bless and protect those teachers and those students from our local leaders to our state leaders to our national leaders. Remind them that they're in service positions, that they're not here or there to represent a party or a platform, but they're there to represent the people. That's why they're representatives, elected officials. Father, place a humility, a humility over all of our leaders. And Father, I pray that, that you would inspire and, and empower the church to be the church, that we would go out as representatives of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and our job is to introduce Jesus into a broken, sinful world. Our job is not to con condemn, not to judge, not to point fingers, but to save and redeem. We are a rescue ship, not a cruise ship, and we're going out to save those who are lost. Remind us always of our primary task. Father, we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen and amen. All right, very good. Who else is on board? The Connollys are on board. Uh, Adrian Faith uh, on YouTube. Uh, she says, hi, Pastor Tom and fellow believers. Uh, all right. All right. So let's let's get into our study. Um, I don't know how much of Romans chapter three I'm going to get into because this is one of the rare times in my life where I'm preaching on the same text that I'm teaching on. And that's always a dangerous thing. Um, so I thought that what I would do for the Bible study is remind you of what took place in the 1600s, in the 16th century. What took place? What caused the Reformation? And what, what was going on? And so let's, in our minds, go back to a time when there was one church And that church was spreading all over the European world, all over the, the, into the Asian world, it, what we call the Middle East. It was spreading. 
In the days of Martin Luther, and we have to add Calvin and Swingley into this whole era of the Reformation, but certainly Luther is attributed to the uh, teeing up the ball and kicking it, right? He's, he, it, when he put up the 95 Theses on the church door, that was the beginning. But what got him there? What got him to the point where he was breaking away and concerned about a church that had existed for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. I guess you got to understand Luther's conversion. Luther's dad wanted him to be an attorney. Luther was highly intelligent. And so he not only had a theological degree eventually, but he also had a legal degree. Never went into law. We know the story is one day he was traveling on his horse and he was in the most violent of, of storms that he could record in his life. And he, it was so violent and the lightning, the lightning around him was so bad that he basically prayed to God that if he survived the storm, he would become a monk. He would join a monastery and, and become a monk. And miraculously, he survived the storm because lightning was popping all over. And, and, and uh, so to his dad's um, frustration, he, he, he decides to become a monk. And he just chews up the word of God. He just chews it up. And, 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 and he becomes the best of the best of the church. He becomes a church leader. He is, he is, he is in Germany. He is um, leading a church and teaching at a seminary uh, and a college. But, but they, there was no difference then. Colleges were church-based. Does that make sense? Uh, almost same as the colleges that first came to the United States. The colleges that came to the United States were not secular. They were religious colleges that taught a global uh, worldview, a, a worldview. And so, you know, it, one of the things we always forget is the word university comes from the idea that we're trying to bring unity out of diversity. The whole term we forget sometimes that, 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 that colleges, colleges absolutely have defied their own defini de definition in the 20th and 21st century. They want to tell you there is no unity and it's just diversity. The goal of a university was to study eclectically and find out what in all of it is unifying, right? Because if you can find what's unifying, then you can then create a society that will agree that these are the unifying factors. Does that make sense? And so the universities were not designed to tell everybody to go in, in every direction they wanted to go in. It was designed to bring people collectively inward and unite us, finding unity in diversity. So at any rate, Luther, begins to get frustrated with the church of his day. Now, you've got to remember, let's picture this. We're all living in Germany. We're all speaking German, right? And we have two major influences in our lives. German leadership, politically, and the church. Those are the two factors. In Luther's day, they were not easily separated. You know this, or I know this, we know this, because when Luther, when Luther got frustrated, hey, Reese, how you doing? What are you doing? Can you come here and give me a hug for a second? Why 
Want to say hi to everybody? Yeah. On the camera? Look at the camera right there. Hi. <laughs> this is Reese, my grandson. Good to see you. All right, I got to teach class. Go see Dada. He's right out there. <laughs> All right. So, so where was I? So I want you to picture this. He, when, when Luther, when Luther finally got pressure, and I know I'm jumping around a little bit, when, but, but when he realized the situation that he was in, the pressure that the church was putting on him, his appeal was to the governor, was to the leader of his area, right? Because there, there, the, the, the church and, and government were intertwined. Oh, we're going to get to that. We'll get to that. So, so as Luther is studying and as Luther is teaching, I think it's important to understand that Luther had an, an amazing sensitivity to his own humanity, his own sinfulness. Why is that important? He realized that there wasn't enough confession or enough repentance that he could do to get rid of the yuck inside. He used to go to his professors and fellow and fellow professors and, and go to and go to priests and say, but I'm not clean. It's not gone. He he wrestled probably more with what went on in here and in here than he did by his physical actions. He didn't like himself. He didn't like his thoughts. He didn't like where his thoughts went. And so he would go to confession and he would do his penance and he would do all the things the church said to do and it wasn't freeing him. Yeah, there, there were, I mean, he went through fasting he went through all sorts of, uh, of what we call uh, spiritual disciplines, and none of them seemed to work to the point where we know that he even made his own flog and he would whip himself in the back uh, to try to beat himself into submission. So I just want you to realize at the crooks, at the, at the, at the center of Luther's spiritual issue, is I don't know if I'm right with God. Here I am a monk, here I am a religious leader, here I am a teacher, and I personally don't know if I'm right with God, and I can't do enough to get right with Him. Okay? He does a bit in some of his writings. He talks about the fact that, that, he, you know, that, that he dealt with anger and hatred towards certain things and sort, certain... Uh, uh, issues. He, he, I think he dealt with with um, uh, sexual th things, it, it, it lust, and. But notice, unlike most people, Luther had the innate ability to start with himself, which is rare. Look at most of us. Most of us put on a put on a a, a plastic veneer. And then find everybody else's faults. We don't want to do an honest assessment of us, right? Now let's add to that. You have the Roman church, the church of that day, in the process of building St. Peter's Basilica, right? The church that we know of in Rome. In order to build that church, they need resources. They need money. So throughout all of the regions, the idea came that added on, added on to confession, added on to penance, was that if you donated money and resources to building St. Peter's Basilica, you would get indulgences. You would get a letter for giving sin. And so imagine, 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 you know, you're, you're, you're trying to scrape up some money so that you could have a week's worth or a month's worth or a year's worth of sins erased. Or if you gave enough money, maybe a lifetime. 
of sins erased. Inherently, inherently in the process, you realize, inherently in the process of selling indulgences is the idea that we're not right with God. Or else it doesn't work, right? If I, if I started a new theology today telling you all that you needed to buy your forgiveness, you would say, wait a minute, I'm already forgiven, right? You know your justification. You know the source of your forgiveness so well, I couldn't dupe you. But understand, built into their process, in that theology, that really the only sins that were forgiven by Jesus were the ones from your, from your birth to when he became a believer. From that point on, you had to handle your sins. And you did that through repentance, contrition, penance, and the cycle just continued. We're going to get to that. So that's the next thing. So, so I want you to realize that probably everybody had a little bit of that struggle that Luther had. Or else they wouldn't be by the indulgences. Inherently, everyone in his area, no matter how much worship you did, no, how, no matter how much penance you did, everyone was feeling guilty. And so hence... They're willing to spend money and pay. And so now, so, so now Luther is concerned about that theologically as well as the German people are worried about it physically, politically. We need that money in our country. We need that money here. We don't need that money going to Rome to build a building. So you see the interconnectedness, right? Then when you add worship, I want you to imagine that every day that you went to go worship on Sunday, you were going there to worship because you're supposed to, but you didn't understand a single word that was being said. Because the worship was the worship was being done in Latin. Right? It was being done in Latin. Because because the 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 the, the Septuagint was written in Latin, and so the language of the of of Biblical scholars was Latin. It wasn't Greek and Hebrew. It was Latin. So, so Luther begins to, 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 to start wondering, why aren't we worshiping in our language? Why isn't this happening in our language? Why are we selling indulgences and forgiveness? And, and, and I don't even, that's not going to make me feel any writer with God. Because you you put pen to paper and told me so so his his it's all kind of converging and 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 then he begins to he begins to study the scriptures and he's realizing that the average believer out there doesn't do that they don't have the Bible. And all of this starts to stun him. And so when Luther put up the 95 Theses on the church door, which would have been like putting it on the bulletin board, right? The city bulletin board, because the church was always the center of the community. He was wanting to say, basically, these are the things I'm pondering that I don't understand. And we as a culture, we as a city, we as a people need to start discussing some of these things. And he's got 95 things that he lists, all of them around what I've talked about just now. Why is our worship not in German? Why aren't these things happening? Why is this the practice of our times? Why the selling of indulgences? Why, right? And, and, and so he's beginning to, to formulate his thinking and... and this starts what he's hoping to be a reformation. Not a revolution. It's a reformation. I would say that for some people in the United States, they're seeking that today. A reformation. That our nation would reform itself and go back to a constitutional perspective rather than maybe a socialist perspective. There are people pointing that kind of, uh, seeing that kind of diversity, right? 
And so, so there, 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 there's there. If if I'm politically seeing what some are saying, is they're saying no, 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 no. We don't want to go that way. We want to reform and go back to the way it's supposed to be. Right? Does that make sense? Luther is saying theologically, I think we've made a mistake. Oh, no, it was long formed, but it's in Latin, right? And the King James was translated from the Latin. So Luther had the knowledge of Jesus Christ and what God sent him for and what he was supposed to be taking away all our sins and so forth. Luther had that knowledge, right? You're, Am I too far out? No. He had a knowledge that Jesus died on the cross. Was he free from the sin? Which sin? He believed that Jesus died for his original sin and to the sin to the point where he became a believer. No, they don't today. Why do you have to pay penance for your sin? Why is there purgatory? Yes, that's what the Reformation creates. That's what I want you to know is that he's the father of the faith that we stand today. He birthed our church and he birthed all Protestant churches, if you understand the distinction of a Protestant church versus what we call the, the, the International Catholic Church, that's the, the, what happened. He was trying to reform the church. He didn't want more than one. What we have today, Luther did not want. He did not want uh, um, 31 flavors of, of Christianity. He, he didn't. He was trying to reform the church. But what he got was a backlash. He got a backlash politically. He got a backlash theologically. And even though he could hold his own in an argument biblically, nobody was arguing biblically. They were arguing church practice. They were ar arguing church councils. They were arguing the no, no differently than the way the Pharisees argued with Jesus. Do you see it? No differently than the way the Pharisees argued with Jesus, but that's not our tradition. And Jesus is saying, I don't care about your tradition. I care about the word, right? So one of the things I want you to realize, that every generation faces this issue and every generation either reforms and continues to avoid the mistakes or we fall back. We face this challenge constantly as the church because satan attacks the church in ideology he attacks the church in pulling you one degree off two degrees off three degrees off the truth because what's the big deal if i get rid of that what's the big deal if i i sacrifice that what's the big deal if i back away from that and before you know it the back away means you can back away right um Luther at one point is scooped up and taken to Wittenberg Castle and he is protected for nearly a year or more because the church wants to kill him. They've, they've, they've called him a heretic. They've excommunicated him. And I know I'm skipping over a lot of history, but you just need to understand that he realizes now that the church is not going to be reformed. There's even this, this moment when he's on trial because the governor and in, in, uh, 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 the leader of Germany wants to hold this, this kind of a trial. It sounds so like when Paul was before the Roman leaders, right? Um, it sounds so much like that. And that's where, where Luther's where Luther's famous uh, statement, here I stand, is made. Where Luther says, basically, I'll debate you on anything you want to debate as long as the basis of our discussion is the Word of God. Because here I stand. This is my only source and norm for truth. Not a pope, not a political leader, not a anything, not a church council. The word of God is the debate. Here I stand. And he signed his own death warrant, right? 
and, and the church wants to destroy him. When he's hidden away, when he's hidden away, he begins to study even more in depth. And he begins to study this latter part of Romans chapter 2 and this first part of Romans chapter 3. And this is, I think, the defining moment. And the only way that you can understand this is you still have to put yourself in Luther's place. He doesn't have an answer to his dilemma. What's Luther's dilemma? Even to this point, even in the midst of arguing, even in the midst of saying this needs to be the norm, in the midst of all of it, what's Luther's dilemma? What's that? Getting right with God. Because at the end of the day, <laughs> that's what we need. <clears throat> at the end of the day, if we're going to end up standing before God, I need to know that I'm going to be okay. And there's nothing that Luther's finding. It is in this time period that he's beating himself. It's in this time period that he swears he sees Satan in the room and he throws an ink blot at him, and, and, uh, you know, the, the bottle of ink, and throws it at the wall. And, and I understand that, that it's still stained, right, by, by that black ink. Luther's in a spiritual battle. He hasn't formulated his, his, his entire thinking. He's shifting. Look, at you, you want to talk about, you know, all the fish moving this way and one's moving this way? Luther is, is, is going against the political leaders because they don't want the disruption with the church, right? So they're telling him to back down. Church leaders are telling him to back down. He's been excommunicated. I mean, you can't get any worse than the church telling you you're going to hell. I mean, this is like mind splitting. I can't imagine what he was going through internally. You, you ever reach those points when you think that nobody understands what I'm going through? Luther had to be there. He had to be there. There was nobody. Swingley is in a whole different country, right? Um, Calvin's in a whole, it's all happening. They're not even near each other. He starts diving into the Bible because he thinks the Bible should be in the German language. So Luther translates the Bible into German, and it's still the German Bible today. In one year, one man translates the Bible into German. I just want you to know, your NIV, your NASB, your ESV, 12, 20 theologians, years spent. Luther in one year translates the Bible into German. And he gets to this section in Romans. And now you got to understand that Luther went to the seminary, <clears throat> became a doctor in theology. 95% of his learning was church history and church practices, not the scriptures. So even the even priests and, and, and people that were brought that were trained, this was not the predominant source. You were basically taught to follow the patterns of those of us who have been before us. So so I'm not going to try to get into my sermon, but if you would go to chapter three. Verse 19, Luther says, or not Luther, Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 19, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous. No one will be justified. No one will be right with God 
in, in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. And Luther goes, duh. The law is predominantly there to show me my sin. The law convicts me. No wonder I'm so convicted. Wait a minute. Paying penance is a law. Paying indulgences is a law. It's telling me to do something. He, make, he makes this connection finally that the, everything that every good Christian is doing to try to rid themselves of their sin is all based on their actions. And Luther's concern was, what if my action is not good enough? What if, I'm, what if I'm doing my Hail Marys and Our Fathers and my mind sins? Is, am I done? Am I forgiven? Is my forgiveness? What, what, what happens? So, so he begins to realize that there's nothing that I can do to make myself right with God. Which doesn't solve his dilemma yet, but he now, now he understands why he's hurting so bad. And then he gets to verse 21. And in the, NAS, in the NIV 84, it says, but now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known. And Luther, some translation says righteousness of God. But even if it's of God, what it means is whose righteousness is it? It's God's. I, I really believe, and I can't wait to talk to him, that he hit that phrase and he backed away and he, I don't know how many days, weeks, hours, I don't know what he spent pondering. I'm not the one that has to get right with God because God is offering a righteousness. But I, but I thought he was the one that was angry with me. I thought he was the one that was mad at me. I thought he was the one I had to appease. Are you with me? Can you stop for a second? The only thing he discovered is what Peter and Paul knew in the first century. What happened between then and here? The church bit the apple of did God really say? And they kept biting the apple and kept biting the apple until they all of a sudden created a theology that was so far away from the gospel that it wasn't saving people. Or if it was saving them, it was giving them such a weak gospel that at the end of the day, they didn't know if they were going to heaven. What's that? Well, Luther's going to later on in writings, uh, Steve, is going to say that this hugely benefited the church because millions and millions of dollars of value moved towards the churches building building these massive tabernacles and these massive cathedrals um, and, and, and got priests and other leaders rich. Um, and so, so for Luther, in some places, he talks about that he wasn't sure there was a difference between the offerings to the church and taxation to the state. <laughs> that, 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 that to the average believer, they were the same. So what I want you, yes. Same.
And so we're, let's talk about that for a second. So uh, I'm not going to repeat what Leonard said because I'm just going to talk about it. If we can appreciate, if we can sit here in this room and you out there, if we can appreciate what took place from the first century until Luther's day, we need to understand that this is how the enemy attacks the church. This is how the enemy attacks any Christian. Is that how do you get right with God? There's only two ways. You understand that? There's only two ways to get right with any deity. Do exactly what they say to do is the one way. All of them, all the laws. And hence, hence, as you said, the church very rarely quoted this, but when it did quote it, it quoted the law. Do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. Here's what I want you to do now. Here's what you got to do now. Here's what you're not doing that you need to do. You need to stop doing this, but doing that. And all of that was a confusion of the doctrine of sanctification, which became a guilt-ridden process that everyone... Can you imagine leaving church feeling worse than when you came in? They did. And people do today. And so and so one of the things that Leonard said, and, and you did not hear on, online, is that don't we face the same challenge today? The answer is yes and always. Yes and always. Because the enemy will want us to get back to the law that it's up to us. Because he knows if we make it about us, we're going to end up feeling failures because we don't even do what we want to do, right? I mean, so so he he what he does is he gets us around and and bypasses the cross of Jesus Christ and somehow gets it back onto us. So there are churches today that if you that will talk about the evidence of the evidence of your Christianity is in the amount of money that you get. It's in the number of times you come to church. It's it's on your proper life that you've getting, gotten rid of these things or stopped these practices or did this or did that. Notice, every time a church gets back to what you do, it's the law. There's a difference between do and done. You only do because it's not done yet. But what if it's already done? I never thought about it that way, but write that down. Because and someone's heart remind me I just said that. If it's already done, then you then do becomes insignificant. I've said this before. I could easily change the way I preach and get more money into from the rooted's plate. I could guilt you into giving. I could tell you that if you're a Christian, you ought to be giving more. You ought to be tithing. You ought to be doing this. You ought to be doing that. Shame on you for not trusting God. And I, we would get more money. And I'm a crazy pastor who tells you that you don't have to give anything. You should want to. It's about you. It's not about him. He doesn't need your money. That everything we do is in response to something that's already done. We cannot attach our Christian sanctification to justification, to righteousness, how I get right with God. Sanctification is how the righteous live. Right? Now that we're in a friendship or we're in a relationship, this is what that how this gets lived out. I'm not earning the relationship. We're already in it. It's already done. And so one of the things Luther's realizing is that, wait a minute, if there is a righteousness from God, what's that? What is that? And he is going to develop as you go as you go through this text. You see, there's no difference. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all in an in even plane. We're all in a in the same spot. 
every one of us is unrighteous. Doesn't matter. Every human being on the planet is unrighteous before God because all have sinned and fall short, right? And, and for those of you who, who may not know, the word sin, the word sin in the Greek is the word harmatia. It, it, means, it means to draw back a, a, an arrow, shoot it, and it f embarrassingly falls short of the target, right? The idea is that's the goal, and you missed it completely. I mean, it's not about hitting the bullseye. You didn't even hit the target. It, 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 it's like backing up on a cliff and jumping off and getting to the other side and missing. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all are unrighteous. And then he says, but are justified freely. Verse 24. We're made righteous. We're made right with God freely. By his grace. By his grace. By his love. Through the death and resurrection that came from Jesus Christ. Through the redemption. And all of a sudden, Luther sits back and goes, Yeeks! Of course! Now I understand that the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. Because it's His righteousness that He's giving to me as a free gift because He bore my sin. I don't have to bear my sin. I don't have to pay penance. He drank the cup to its last drop and He said it's finished, done, the price is paid. And so Luther all of a sudden captures the truth of the gospel. Purely. He now knows it. He now knows the gospel of Jesus Christ in its purity and its strength. And now... He's like Jesus. He is set. He, be, he no longer wavers. It is incredible how his writings change, how his confidence changes. He begins to write him after him after him after him of him of declaration of God's grace. A mighty fortress is our God that 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 is sung on many Reformation days, written by Luther based on Psalm 46. He is like on fire. And right about this time, right near town, Gutenberg creates the printing press. So how many coincidences do there need to be before you realize that God has a plan? For the first time ever, Luther's writings start getting printed and disseminated. In German, the Bible gets printed in German. For the first time ever, someone could own the Word of God and have it in their house. So what you and I, what we all need to realize is the Reformation was a restoration first and foremost to the Word of God. The Word of God. Because we have to have an authority. Where do we derive truth? Where do we get the source of our information? It's not from church politics. It's not from church bodies. It's not from denominations. It's from the Word of God. Our debate, our discussions should always be healthy discussions about the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? Right? Right? Secondly, and, and, and why that's so important, is Luther realized that when the church got off-center, it was because they moved away from the Word of God and started to rely on human tradition and the interpretations of men. Well, we've, I've seen that in my lifetime. I've seen in my lifetime pastors divert from the Word of God and, and take their whole church and take it astray because he didn't see something in the scriptures the way the rest of the church did. He thought he was getting creative. One of the things a pastor should never do is be creative. 
We don't create, we don't speak something new. We speak a very old message as clearly as possible. That's our job. Our job is to slice through anything that the enemy would use to distract our face and set the, 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 the heart and mind soul of the sheep firmly into God's word, right? Luther realized that the church, you guys, should be so rooted in the word that you would correct the pastor. And by the time Luther ends and he realizes that there's going to be not just one church, he's not going to reform. And he knows he's creating a church body. The first thing he did was take the church body and turned it upside down. For, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the church body was like this. Pope guy at the top, cardinals, bishops, priests, you. Luther went like this and said, you are the church. You are the body of Christ. And we're servants. He rightfully took the leadership of the church away from the pastors and preachers and seminary professors and said, it's in the body, all of us. The authority to baptize, the authority to get, the, give communion, the authority to preach is yours. You grant it to me as, as, as one of the body to perform that task here. But it's your power. We live in a world even today where, you know, uh, Anne-Marie, you sent me that thing about <laughs> baptisms becoming null and void because the words weren't exactly correct. Right? My, my concern is how legalistically do we get? Right? Baptism is baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right? Trinitarian. It's what we are. Jesus is baptized in that way. If we begin to develop a system, which is always the temptation of the enemy, you didn't do that right. Notice the word do. Realize that do was associated to an act of grace, baptism. Satan will always attack grace. Your marriage is null and void. Your this is that. Da, 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 da. See the legalism in all of that? We have to realize that we always want to make it about us. That we, ever since Adam and Eve sinned, we want to be the center of the world. and want to have it be around us. We have to recognize that at Christians, and that's the first thing we have to die to. The, the, a broken and contrite heart is not, oh man, I'm always bad. It's, it's, I have the inclination to make it about me. And that's always bad. It's always a danger. What that does is surrender me into, it's always about you, God. So that means i got to seek your kingdom first. I've got to trust in your word. It's always this kind of, I got to look outside of myself for the authority. I got to look outside of myself for someone to define for me what's real and true. And then Satan's going to attack again. And the, the answer is no, the only place you'd look is here. Isn't it interesting that the word of God is the thing that introduces us to God? It is a thing that reminds us that he's a redeeming God. It is the same thing that tells us how we ought to live. Don't listen to a human being unless they're telling you exactly what it says here. Because the tendency will always be to get back to do. Right? Can you imagine after the Christian press and lots of people started reading the Bible? You would think that they were probably just at the first church, just kind of like 
question, 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 and I wonder what, you know, the Catholic Church did, I mean. Well, the Catholic Church and, uh, excommunicated anybody that followed Luther or Calvin or Swingley, so that's the first thing the Catholic Church did. But one of the things you need to understand is that this all had to be taught. You had to teach bad theology out of people. Luther had to teach bad theology out of priests. So when Luther wrote the small catechism, he wrote it for parents, fathers in particular, so that fathers would have a clear understanding of the six chief parts of the Christian faith and would teach it properly to their kids. We turned that into send your kids in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade to Sunday school or confirmation, and we'll teach them, yeah. which was a huge mistake. But something you should start with them there, so it's, it's something that you do in the home, or else they're going to think the only time you're churchy or spiritual is at church. Yeah. That's what we effectively did. We effectively said, we're going to do all the church stuff at church, and we're going to do life stuff at home. And then kids got 18, 19 years old. We said, why they leave the church? Because you didn't share them. You never told them that it was supposed to be for life. You never lived it out. And so, and, and, and so the large catechism was for priests. It was to correct them. Much of what, what, much of what you have in the Book of Concord is, is him now realizing, not only have I hit something, now I've got to reteach and train things. So, so from a firmly rooted perspective, homothumadon, one-mindedness, that we're a rescue ship and not a cruise ship. These are all principles that dawned on me as core to biblical truth that we get lost. And I not only had to remind myself, but I had to reteach it to a whole group of people. That there are principles that firmly rooted holds that other churches do not. The question is, are they biblical? Right? If they're biblical, then we stand by them. And I think they are. There's evidences that they are. But see how Satan will attack. Be wise, everyone, how the enemy's goal is to always draw us away from this. You, every day, must, must, must we, every day, must die to ourselves. Realize I need this word for my nourishment and, what we, and, and, and my sustenance. And trust that it will guide my life. And if I'm around other believers and other Christians who see things the same way, we'll grow together, we'll walk each other home, we'll be on the path, we'll rescue people who start to get off the path, and, and, and it's, it's how the church functions. All right. Um, any last comments or questions? Yes, Tim. Um. So the printing press came out at the same time that uh, um, Luther was doing uh, the straight lady Bible, so I was able to give out. Was there persecution from those making the Bibles and distributing it? Because were, were we not allowed to read the Bible? But, let's, let's put it this way. There was what appears to be a divine protection over that area in Germany. The church, the, the, the church, church lost its influence. Luther won a huge populace of the people as soon as he began to preach sermons in German. And as soon as he began to do services in German, as soon as he began to, to, to produce literature and writings in German, he won the affinity, the heart, the heart of the people. And so the, the church was in a losing battle in that ground. And then you got Calvin and Swingley and they're, they're gonna lose battles. Um, Something that you might not know, um, and I have no time to get into it, but let me make this statement, and maybe you'll, you'll, you'll remind me to bring this up at a different time. Protestant church, Luther, Calvin, and Swingley. Every Protestant church that exists today comes from one of those three. Split as many as they will, split because you didn't like the color of the carpet, I don't know, whatever. Theologically, theologically, every Protestant church either finds its core theology under Calvin, 
Luther, or Swingley. And the three of them once met. They wanted to see if they could create one church and not more than one. And if I remember right, there were 13 topics. And they agreed on all but three. And it started creating the division and the split. And, and um, uh, election, baptism, Lord's Supper, and a little bit of the end time. So maybe four, but it was mainly baptism, the Lord's Supper, and election. And so just about every church that you have today, you can funnel it, okay, like the Church of Christ, the Church of God, okay, go, go one level up, well, they came from here, they came from here, they split from here, up, there's Erasmus, or there's Calc, right? So just so you know. All right, um, yeah. I think uh, historians argue both. I mean, certainly Luther had a, had an effect on um, um, on Swingley. Some say that Calvin was far enough away that that, that not, but I, I don't think so. I, I but but certainly uh, you can't say that he made the two of them either. The fact is is that God had had three. Uh, like a, a revival that was kicked off by those three. Adrian says, I think it's also important to note that faith without works is dead, but the reason for our works is because we already know we are forgiven and extended that grace from God, and we are grateful. Adrian, you are correct. And and I think best said is my whole Christian life of sanctification is not to earn anything, because it's already done, it is to simply live as a child of God and to say thank you. Does that make sense? So my whole life, if asked why do you do that, I do it to be in God's family, in God's kingdom. This is how kingdom people live. And two, it is one, my whole life is just one thank you to what he has done, right? That's probably the best separation of justification and sanctification, right? Um, and those are theological terms um, that we can get to sometime. All right, we got to go to worship. It's about five or six minutes away. Uh, I'm going to shut off my microphone. Let's pray for worship, and then we'll um, we'll.